Happiness is not an emotion. It's a state of vitality characterized by many pleasurable emotions, but it is not an emotion per se. I heard one what? <laughs> Some of you may be a little surprised by this assertion. Happiness is at once both very familiar, highly desirable, and widely misunderstood. It's familiar. Everyone here has had periods of happiness sometime in their lives, and you know it when you experience it. It's familiar. Excuse me. It's desirable. We are all egoists. Everybody in this room wants to be happy, or to be happier, or to stay happy. But it is widely misunderstood. Like many abstract concepts that involve values, the concept of happiness has been distorted, obfuscated, and denied by philosophers, making it harder for us to understand what we need to do to be happy. But fortunately, Ayn Rand sorted out the philosophical issues for us. In this talk, I'm going to cash in on her work to clarify what happiness is, to chew the means whereby you gain it, and to offer some immediately practical advice for increasing your happiness. I will conclude with a little pep talk regarding the place of happiness in your life. Now, you should all have a one-page handout. This is basically just an outline of the talk, and so you can see as we move through here. Ayn Rand defined happiness as follows. Happiness is that state of consciousness which proceeds from the achievement of one's values. Notice she didn't say it was an emotion that proceeds from the achievement of a goal. That would be the emotion of joy. Joy is the emotion that proceeds from the achievement of a goal. Happiness is that state of consciousness, it's bigger and wider, that proceeds from the achievement of one's values. That is bigger than one goal. Emotions aren't the genus of happiness because emotions are ephemeral. Happiness is a durable state. If you feel miserable for two hours in a day, it was not a happy day. If you had two bad days in a week, it was not a happy week. To be in a state of happiness, the positive experience needs to endure most of the time. What's the borderline? 80 or 90 percent? Fortunately, we all know the borderline case fallacy, so I don't have to tell you the exact border. You can figure that out for yourself. Second, happiness concerns achieving not a goal, but one's values. Happiness is not an isolated bright spot. It's a glow throughout your life. This is why I think it is helpful to think of happiness as a state of vitality, a state of vitality as opposed to a state of suffering. Now, to really understand this, I think you need to know that there are several different sources of positive affect. That's affect, A-F-F-E-C-T. Positive affect is some kind of pleasure or pain. Uh, affect is the general term for pleasure or pain. Positive affect would be some kind of pleasure, which means it reflects some kind of successful functioning. And all three sources of affect are necessary for happiness. The first source of affect is also the simplest source, bodily pleasure. There are good feelings that you feel when your physical needs are met and when your body is in a good state of physical functioning. If you are hungry and you eat something, you feel good, satiated. If you are without pain or tension, your body has a kind of overall pleasant buzz to it. 
Similarly, when you wake refreshed from sleep, there is a good feeling. These are all bodily feelings of pleasure and pain, of pleasure, bodily affect. Now, other more intense feelings can mask them, but you all know, you all know what I mean by bodily pleasure, right? Okay. These, this is not emotions, right? These are real-time readouts on the state of your physical functioning. And of course, there are corresponding painful bodily experiences in addition to literal pain, such as when you get a cut or you have a headache. There are also signals of hunger and thirst, and these are unpleasant. Now, in the heading of bodily uh, pain, I think tension deserves a special mention. When your shoulders are tight or any part of your body is tight, I mean, just do that. Tighten your hand. It doesn't feel good. That's affect. If you are physically tense for hours on end, you can't be happy. You need to have positive affect in, of your body as part of being happy. If you, are, if you have physical uh, pain, that is going to cast a pall over your experience and prevent you from being happy. Happiness is the total package, and that includes the pleasure of physical well-being. Now, the second source of affect is the most overlooked source of affect. It is the pleasantness or unpleasantness that indicates the state of your mental functioning. Now, the simplest example of this is overload. How many of you have felt overload? Or as we objectivists say, crow overload? The crow just is that space in your head that gets overloaded. This, I'm not going to explain the story. Now, do you ex enjoy crow overload? No. It is a state of mental dysfunction. It is unpleasant. Now, what's going on in this situation is you, more ideas are coming up from your subconscious, or maybe there's more outside stimulation than you can actually handle right now. And you're, but you're trying to handle it. And as a result, there's a tremendous feeling of strain. That's what the overload is, the strain of you trying to hold on to these ideas. Now, this strain is actually an alert of a problem. It's a signal that thinking is failing. Thinking is failing. If you are overloaded, you literally cannot think. Because you literally cannot hold the full context. In order to think, you need to be able to have access to background knowledge. And the way you have access to that is it comes up into the fringes of awareness where you can monitor and notice it and make connections. If you are overloaded, first of all, you don't have the space to listen to these things coming up. And second of all, even if things come up, you take one and you lose something else. You can't hold the context in mind. Some get dropped, some never get into focal awareness. Trying to do mental work when you are overloaded is like overdriving your headlights on the highway. You might get away with it short range, but it's suicidal. How many really stupid decisions have gotten made because you were overloaded and didn't hold the full context? Okay, that is a bit of a hobby horse of mine, but the point is you get effective, affective readouts on how your mind is doing, just as you get affective readouts on how your body is doing. We don't have a lot of words for these states. The positive states are things like clear-headedness, which feels good, and maybe purposefulness, which also feels good. It's popular to call this a state of flow. I think this is all this mental positive affect regarding your mental state of functioning is part of happiness. It's an important part of happiness. 
Now, of course, the third and most familiar source of affect is emotions. Emotions are different from these real-time readouts on body and mind, because they are a product of ideas. Essentially, when you make a prediction that something is going to be good for you, you have pleasurable emotions. And when you predict that something is going to be bad for you, you have unpleasant ones. But emotions can be quite complex. And for the purposes of this lecture, I am just going to keep it simple. I think the emotional component of happiness, per se, involves four emotions. Joy, which is the emotion you experience when you achieve a goal or gain a value. The, you know, there's a reason why people think happiness is just joy. It is a big part of it. Pride, which is the emotion you experience when you see you lived up to your own standards. And this adds another layer of pleasure to anything that you've done. Confidence, which is the emotion you experience when you believe you can achieve your goals. And in fact, one of the things that happens when you achieve something that was difficult, you get not just happiness, you get not just joy from having achieved it, you also get additional confidence that you're going to be able to achieve something else again. The fourth positive emotion that is a key part of happiness is love. Now, love is the feeling you have when you contemplate a value. When you look and say, I'm looking at my assistant right now. I love my assistant. I feel good just thinking, look, I have this person who is worth I'm looking at my other assistant. I love my assistant. I feel good just thinking about it. I have these people to support me. My feet, I don't know if you can tell, you probably can't. My feet actually just went on the ground by my thinking about someone that is a value to me and letting myself experience the love for that. Love is a very important part of happiness. Sometimes people think that's woo-woo, but it's real. So when I say happiness is a state of vitality, I'm trying to capture this big picture that there are many aspects of successful functioning that all feed into happiness. Now, toward this end, I'd like to uh, remind you of a very important passage from Ayn Rand related to this. She wrote, the maintenance of life and the pursuit of happiness are not two separate issues. To hold one's life as one's ultimate value and one's own happiness as one's highest purpose are two aspects of the same achievement. Existentially, the activity of pursuing rational goals is the activity of maintaining one's life. Psychologically, it's the result, reward, and concomitant. Its, re its result, reward, and concomitant is an emotional state of happiness. When you think of happiness, you need to think of the whole kit and caboodle. You need to think of life, everything involved in life. I hope you've gotten, I hope I've concretized the positive here. I think as, cementi as part of cementing your understanding of happiness, I want to say a word or two about its antithesis, which is suffering. Suffering is ongoing pain or distress. It is characterized by the emotions of despair and frustration because it seems like there is no way out of it, no matter what you do. Often it is exacerbated by guilt because you think it's your fault that you're suffering. Unless you intervene, these emotions will, will fuel one another creating a vicious cycle of self-doubt and self-destructive motivation. Now, of course, you can easily be thrust into a state of suffering by external events. Illness, injury, the loss of a loved one. There is no shame in suffering or in feeling any emotion whatsoever, but you should view the onset of suffering as a klaxon alerting you that your life 
and your happiness is at stake, and your intervention is desperately needed. You know what a klaxon is? It's an alert. You need to understand suffering. You need to understand happiness. You understand that, need to understand these are states of vitality. On your handout, I've listed four states of vitality toward the top of the page. Suffering, serenity, contentment, and, and ever greater joy. I think it's helpful to understand these four states and how they're related to get this full picture of what it means to say happiness is a state of vitality. Suffering is a state of decreased vitality, where your values are actively being lost. Your scope of action is reducing, your life energy is ebbing. Suffering is really bad. Serenity is a neutral state. Think of it as a temporary breathing state between suffering and happiness. You may feel some pain, but you are not experiencing despair or guilt or self-doubt. You may experience some pleasure, but it really doesn't count, amount to joy. You're not experiencing pride or confidence. Serenity is a quiet state. It's not terrible but it's a transition state. It's not a happy state. You can be extremely sad in a state of serenity. The first state of happiness is, I think, the level of contentment. If you add to serenity joy, confidence, pride, some, at least some little everyday joy, some small level of confidence, some small level of pride, and you take away the pain, then I think you've gotten to contentment, and I think that qualifies as happiness. So when you think happiness is a state of vitality, you can be at a kind of a modest level of contentment, and that is happy. That is happiness. You do not have to be an alt 80 to 90% of the time, but you do need to be at least content 80 to 90% of the time. That would be a state of happiness. That would be a state of vitality where systems are working. Now, of course, we're all going for the higher levels. And in a real sense, there continues to be more option for how much happiness you have that increasing joy and the greater intensity of happiness comes from increasing scope of action. Increasing scope of action. If you, uh, for example, when you get married and you find someone to share your life with, and this is actually going to materially change your life and you're going to have an entire set of values associated with it, this can change your, this actually increases your ability to gain values because the two of you together can actually do things that by yourself you can't do. You can't do without a, a life romantic part. The greatest joy and therefore the maximum state of happiness comes from the achievements that integrate your whole life. Now, this is a huge topic. I actually spoke on this topic last year when I talked about central purpose. That's really what a central purpose is. You set a productive goal that then everything in your life integrates or is consistent with, and that permits you to have much larger scope of action. So uh, I hope we've got the picture here. Happiness is a state of vitality. There are four distinct states that I'm going to be talking about. I'm actually going to turn back to these four states toward the end. Suffering, that is anti-happy. Serenity, that is not happy, but it is tolerable. It's not, a, it's not a klaxon, no klaxons going off. Contentment, which is the basic, you know, kind of the rock bottom of happiness, which is good. And then ever greater joy. Okay.
I'm going to turn back to these when we get back to practical advice. But before then, I want to discuss the idea that joy, the joy that you need in happiness needs to be without despair, without guilt, and without self-doubt. There's another well-known Ayn Rand quote on this topic. Happiness is a state of non-contradictory joy, a joy without penalty or guilt, a joy that does not clash with any of your values and does not work for your own destruction. What does that mean? It means that one event can trigger multiple emotions if there are multiple aspects to it. Just, you know, a hypothetical example. Suppose you started a company that just got sold for millions of dollars. You would, in, you would feel joy from that achievement, but if the way you achieved it led to the loss of the love of your life, you'd also maybe feel despair because the success had this loss associated with it. Or if you, if you got to this point in part by manipulating people around you and destroying relationships, the joy would be tarred by guilt. Or if you worked in such a way that you permanently destroyed your health, it would be bittersweet. There would be some bitter frustration associated with it because you weren't going to be able to enjoy your money. Now, on the other hand, so, this, so that would not be, that would be contradictory joy. On the other hand, if you have the love of your life beside you, if your most admired allies also made a lot of money on the deal, if you are ready to start the next chapter in your life, you will feel incredibly intense happiness. Everything points in the same direction. That is what a joy that does not clash with any of your values and does not work for your destruction is like. And I think this is the big question in happiness. How do you get all of the good things at the same time? How do you eliminate, un, let's face it, unintentional, we're not, we're not manipulators, etc. For us, the question is, how do you eliminate unintentional self-destructiveness from all your action? And that brings us to the next main to major topic, which is the means whereby you get happiness. The objectivist answer is, you develop a rational moral code and then live by it. Purpose of morality is to identify what is needed to live and to be happy. These facts get conceptualized and condensed into a set of moral principles that you can use to guide your action. Unfortunately, this connection between morality and happiness floats for many Ayn Rand fans. So let's take a few minutes to chew the connection under the heading Embracing causality in full. The confusion as it's usually posed to me is, sometimes it seems as if moral principles set up a conflict between the long term and the short term. It can seem as if following rules of morality will make you miserable now, but it's justified because you'll be happy in some distant future. Well, that mythical future happiness is not happiness. Happiness is a durable state of vitality that includes positive affect 80 to 90% of the time. There can be temporary setbacks, but not an extended drought. That kind of trade-off wouldn't be selfish. We are a, a, a shoe sacrifice. We don't sacrifice the short term for the long term or vice versa. We need to integrate the short term and the long term. How do you do that? I'd like to share two important passages from Ayn Rand's fiction that I think show brilliantly how you do this. Now, I know we have some newbies here. I hope you've already read The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged because there are plot spoilers here and you need to plug your ears if you haven't read them. <laughs> okay, so the first passage describes Howard Rourke's reaction to the Stoddard Temple lawsuit. I'm gonna quote and then comment, let me say. So, the situation is, Austin Heller is upset that Rourke is going to handle his defense at the trial. So Heller says, 
What do you know about courtrooms and law? He's going to win. To win what? His case. Is the case of any importance? There's nothing I can do to stop him from touching the building. He owns it. He can blow it off the face of the earth or make a glue factory out of it. He can do it whether I win that so or not." Unquote. Let me pause. Are you seeing the implicit appeal to the principle of property rights here? And the idea there are no conflicts of interest among rational men? Rourke sees the implications. He was the architect. He built the building for the owner. The owner owns his property. He wouldn't have had a job if the owner didn't own the property. That's inherent in the commission. Rourke is okay with that. I'm going to continue the quote. But he'll take your money to do it with. Yes, he might take my money. A little later, we get a little more of Rourke's, and, you know, like three paragraphs later, he's talking to Dominique, and Ayn Rand describes Dominique. She says, quote, her face looked as if she knew his worst suffering and it was hers, unquote. And Rourke says, quote, you're wrong. I don't feel that. What you're thinking is much worse than the truth. I don't believe it matters to me that they're going to destroy it. Maybe it hurts so much that I don't even know I'm hurt. But I don't think so. If you want to carry it for my sake, don't carry it more than I do. I'm not capable of suffering completely. I, ne I never have. It goes only down to a certain point, and then it stops. As long as there is that untouched point, it's not really pain. Dominique asks, where does it stop? And Rourke answers, where I can think of nothing and feel nothing except I designed that temple. I built it. Nothing else can seem very important." Unquote. What is creating that untouched point? It's the joy he's getting from his own creative achievement, from his own efficacy, his pride, his integrity, his purposefulness. This is the principle of independence at work. His achievement is not reduced by the fact that Stoddard doesn't appreciate it and may tear it down. And compared to that, the issue of, uh, compared to the chance of having been able to build, design and build the temple, Losing some money is not that important to Rourke. He is able to see it as small in the scope of his own life. And as a result, he feels the corresponding emotions. I mean, that's an amazing scene. And we see a similar kind of recovery. I would call it a recovery from suffering. In a scene in Atlas Shrugged where Galt tells Dagny about his out-of-context feeling of jealousy toward Reardon, I've condensed this expert excerpt slightly just to smooth it out for his purpose. Quote, I felt a desperate longing. This is he's about Reardon, seeing Reardon, uh, seeing Reardon and knowing that he and Dagny have been lovers. I felt a desperate longing. He was the image of everything I should have been, and he had everything that should have been mine. But it was only a moment. Then I saw the scene in full context again, and in all of its actual meaning. I saw what price he was paying for his brilliant ability, what torture he was enduring, in silent bewilderment, struggling to understand what I had understood. I saw that the world he suggested did not exist and was yet to be made. 
I saw him again for what he was, the symbol of my battle, the unrewarded hero whom I was to avenge and to release. And then I accepted what I had learned about you and him. I saw that it changed nothing, that I should have expected it, that it was right. How did he regain the full context so quickly? He understood the principle of altruism, the nature of altruism. He could see the injustice in the situation even though it wasn't apparent on a superficial glance. And in fact, Reardon himself could not see that he was a victim of injustice in, in that moment. And then, like Rourke, once he holds the wider context and seeing what's really going on with his values, he gets joy from his own momentous achievement in relation to these facts. He discovered this. He is on a mission. He is going to free Reardon. And he sees the future consequences. And of course, on the side, understands why Dagny had responded to Reardon. So Galt closes with a very important paragraph about suffering. He says, quote, Dagny, it's not, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> wrong voice. Quote, Dagny, it's not that I don't suffer. It's that I know the unimportance of suffering. I know that pain is to be fought and thrown aside, not to be accepted as part of one's soul and as a permanent scar across one's view of existence. Don't feel sorry for me. It was gone right then. For Rourke and Galt, it's joy that goes all the way down, not suffering. What makes this possible? Of course, it's fiction, and they're both heroes of integrity and independence. So really the question is, what would make it possible for us? The headline is, Embracing Causality in Full. What I see Rourke and doing here, Rourke and Galt doing here, is totally embracing the law of causality as it relates to them, their pursuit of goals, their pursuit of values, and their life in the world. First of all, both of them, you can see, are applying moral principles to understand the cause and effect in the world around them. In the last lecture, in Harry Binswanger's lecture, he talked about how you use moral principles to predict the future. That is an extremely important use of moral principles. It's not the only use. You know, moral principles are not rules. They're inductions. What a principle does is it essentializes a complex chain of events. You then use them to predict the future, but you also use them to understand the past. You apply a principle by working out the concrete instance of that causal chain in some particular situation. So that's what Rourke did with property rights. He actually worked out, well, you know, he owns it, he could destroy it, he could do, I don't have any rights to that. That is concretely seeing how property rights applies in that situation, and that completely changes well, it changes my evaluation of the situation. I, he seemed to, he didn't show us his process of doing that that much. But Galt did it explicitly. He paused and he held the full context. And it's, he didn't say explicitly altruism, but you can see it's his ideas that he used to see, oh, wait a minute, Reardon isn't actually the, he's actually in a difficult situation here. He's not the lord of, uh, you know, he's not a complete success here. He's actually struggling 
and he needed to have that abstract lens to look at the right aspects of the, con of the concrete situation to make a valid evaluation. That's how they reframe the situation, is by, appeal, by implicit appeal to moral principles. So that's very important. Second thing that they do that I think you can see in those scenes, they remind themselves of their own causal efficacy. This helps them focus on their values and to see what really matters to them in that situation. In both cases, their own achievements are much more important than the external events. And by focusing on that, that changes their emotional reaction. I mentioned that emotions are ephemeral. When you change your perspective on something, your emotions change. And in the third thing, which is also a causal issue, which we really see in Galt's case, and Rourke's it's sort of after the fact, so we don't see it. But in Galt's case, we see him make a conscious intervention to hold the context. Part of embracing the law of causality is embracing your causal agency. You have volition. He had the causal power in that moment to deal with the suffering, and he did. It is clarity about your own causal efficacy that I think makes the suffering go down only so far. If you can hold on to your sense of self, your choice in the moment, your real accomplishments, your world is not rocked by injustices. It's not rocked by disappointments. It's not rocked by external events. Not in the same way. Now, I'm sure you all accept causality. Is there anyone here who does not accept causality? Because you're in the wrong place. OK, all right. But I mean, you know evasion doesn't work, right? Everybody knows that evasion doesn't work, right? That's OK. I mean, I'm just being silly here. But I think embracing causality is something more. You need to actively seek out, for your happiness, you need to actively seek out an understanding of what are the causal ramifications. That is a positive thing that you need to do. It's not just don't evade, it's actively go seek them out. And you especially need to seek out your causal role. What is in your power here? How can I expand my power here? This is how you regain your, you can re, most quickly regain your perspective. OK. So happiness is a very big topic. We all want to be like Rourke and Galt, but we have like less than 15 minutes left. Okay. So I gave myself the goal to give you some immediately practical advice. Okay? So that's what the goal is for this section. Immediately practical and then some promise about other possibilities. Partly because of this push for immediately practical, all three of my suggestions involve eliminating suffering sooner rather than later. You know, Ayn Rand said, in, in, quote, in psychological terms, the issue of man's survival does not confront his consciousness as an issue of life or death, but as an issue of happiness or suffering. Happiness is the successful state of life. Suffering is the warning signal of failure or death. Suffering needs to be fought. It is a warning signal. You are at risk. And as I mentioned earlier, part of the risk is you're at risk of entering a vicious cycle. If you feel despair or self-doubt, you literally temporarily lack the motivation to pursue your goals. If you don't intervene, that if you just stay passive, if you don't actively intervene, what's going to happen is the default on your part can trigger more guilt, more self-criticism, additional despair. It magnifies the problem. This is what's called a vicious cycle. Once that vicious cycle gets going, it takes a bigger intervention to stop it. 
Absent your intervention, suffering fuels further and greater suffering. It's not a stable situation. This is why you need to fight suffering. Don't accept it as a given. Ideally, intervene immediately to reestablish a value-oriented context. That is a learned skill, right? That is, I mean, you can absolutely learn that skill, but it's a learned skill, so you may not be able to figure out how to do that at first. First time you try. So here are some things that you can do right now. I mean, you can. Okay. I don't really literally mean here in the. Lecture, so maybe I shouldn't say right now. But here are three things that you can take away from this lecture. The first is establish a baseline state of vitality that you can maintain. Now, I come from an engineering background and quality control. How does how did Toyota increase the quality of its cars? They Looked at the quality of the cars, and they said, "Okay, we got these problems. What's the biggest problem that's creating the biggest lowest quality? Let's fix that. If you fix that problem, first of all, overall quality goes up, and the second thing is there's a new biggest problem. So you then fix that problem. Well, you want to fix the biggest problem. So if you're suffering a lot." You're going to want okay. You're going to want to figure out how to move from suffering to serenity. You're going to want to learn how to move from serenity to contentment. You're going to want to learn to move from contentment to greater joy, and then ever greater joy, and then ever greater joy. These are the kinds of skills you want to get. But the point is, the advice is, Identify and learn to have better control over moving up the chain to greater happiness. And the way to do this is to learn how to return to a baseline at will. So let me give you a personal example of this. At a certain point, I noticed that it reliably took a half an hour for me to calm down after an angry argument. I mean, a half an hour is a long time to be. You know, upset. I set a goal to shorten that amount of time. I really looked at what I was doing and what I was contributing to my suffering because it was definitely suffering. And it turned out I was stewing and I was aggravating the situation. And I learned how, instead of doing that, to focus on my selfish priorities. And now it takes about five minutes. This is huge, right? This. Raised my level of happiness and improved my relationships. This is what I mean by changing your baseline in some respect. Now, for some of you, it may mean that you need to learn some very basic skills. So, for example, it is always logically possible to move from suffering to serenity. You can be in pain and be serene. You don't need to know objectivism. There are serene people out there. You do need to be willing to accept facts. That is what is going to defuse the despair and the guilt and the self-doubt. And the trick here is, it's, well, it's not really a trick. Accepting facts means accepting your emotions about the facts. If you're experiencing despair or guilt or self-doubt, you will not want to feel those feelings. Right? Nobody wants to feel those feelings. It's not fun. But as Ayn Rand said, to fear to face an issue is to believe the worst is true. I didn't put the quotes on that, but that's a quote from her. Until you actually identify and understand these emotions, you will not really understand the source of your suffering. And you won't know if there are even facts there to accept, because sometimes guilt is unearned guilt, and it dissipates once you look at it. So we're not Buddhist monks, and serenity is not our goal. Happiness is our goal, but serenity is a non-suffering, practical baseline that you can learn to establish to build happiness on, and I, I, to move. It's it's important to be able to do that. It's important if you're suffering to be able to initiate action 
to get to a place of serenity. And that's a learnable skill. You can set that goal. Now, if what you are is you're already pretty serene, great, and you want to move to a level of contentment because there's just no, not enough joy in your life, you want at least regular joy, well, you'll need how to learn how to orient to values and not threats. If you want to move from contentment to that ever greater joy, you'll need to learn how to set doable goals that you're certain will pay off in some way. You'll need even better goal setting and uh, execution skills if you want to get even better skills. So I can say a lot about this. There's a lot to say about how you build your values and increase your scope of action and reap the reward as you go. But I want to keep this something that you can take away. So keep it incremental. Use your common sense. Common sense and a good rational goal will take you far. And whatever you do in this regard is going to give you a double bonus. Because not only will you actually experience more pleasure, you will also gain the self-confidence from taking charge of your emotional life. It's really priceless. All right. Second immediate practical piece of advice. Take your mental needs seriously. Specifically, never ever try to operate your mind outside of its operating range. Consciousness possesses identity. It functions how it functions. If you want to use your mind, if you want to be rational, you need to use it within spec. And this means saying no to overload. No. I mentioned earlier that overload is a source of negative affect. It feels bad. If you're overloaded during much of the working day, you are suffering. You cannot be happy. If that's your case, learning to say no to overload is going to really raise your baseline happiness. But everyone here gets overloaded at times. What everybody here needs to know is that you have direct volitional control over whether you stay in that dysfunctional state or you move to a functional one. When you are overloaded, it is always possible to reduce the load. A basic tactic for this is to offload the ideas to paper. Get them on paper so you don't have to have them in your head. If you haven't yet learned thinking on paper from me, Susie is going to pass around a, a sign-up. You can get my free Thinking Direction starter kit, or you can go to thinkingdirections.com. It is a practical way to reduce the load, and you can use it in any situation. Now, it doesn't always work. Ultimately, the way that you control the mental load is by adjusting your purpose. You change your purpose to be something easier, or maybe a little more abstract, that you can handle. And the test is, are you now not overloaded? So, like, if you're overloaded solving a problem, sometimes you need to switch to something like, say, listing possible ways to solve the problem. And once you see the list, you can pick one. There are many tactics for this, but I can't overstress the importance. This is actually an aspect of staying in focus. You know Leonard Peikoff's definition of focus? Quote, focus is the state of a goal-directed mind committed to achieving full awareness. If you are overloaded, you cannot have full awareness of reality because you have no crow space in which to access your vast storehouse of knowledge. You've cut yourself off. Rather than being committed to full awareness, you are actively denying the possibility of full awareness. This is the choice to focus is your fundamental choice to be a rational agent. It doesn't matter how much effort you're expending, if you're trying to juggle things in your mind, it doesn't matter that you're putting in effort. Focus is not the exertion of effort, it's the direction of attention, or, or just the direction of attention. It's your commitment to some but any purpose, or you're, uh, you're setting a goal, some but any purpose, with a commitment to full awareness of reality. 
So you've got to keep your mind functioning. Just say no to overload. Now, I've been arguing this point for years solely on the logical point, on the logical merits, but today I'm connecting say no to overload. It's not just logical. It's not just part of the choice to focus. It's your happiness, folks. You want to be happy. Say no to overload. You're miserable if you're overloaded. And it is under your volitional control. Okay. All right. Third practical piece of advice about fighting suffering. Don't be afraid to accept the grief that comes with accepting losses. You know, some pain can be, uh, cannot be eliminated. And if, if you, know, you have a, an illness, you may actually, your scope of action may be permanently reduced. Now, go look for options, try to get a cure. It's amazing what can be done. But part of the way that you get serenity in these situations is mourning which is fully accepting the loss of a value. Serenity is consistent with sadness. It's not in the same emotional category with despair and guilt and self-doubt. It's a clean pain. And it's clean because it is a way of contemplating a value and getting clarity about the value that you've lost. This actually strengthens your values. You know, I actually saw this happening before my eyes two weeks ago at Judy Berliner's memorial. So Judy was a world-famous biologist who taught at the UCLA Medical School for 43 years, and eight of her colleagues shared what they admired about her. The two recurring themes were her rigorous scientific approach and her gentle but direct, honest feedback. And every one of her colleagues reported trying to emulate Judy in their own work. They've lost Judy. She's gone. But her values, the values she embodied, are still an important part of their lives. And in honoring Judy, they helped make those values clearer to all of us. And this is why you get some peace from a memorial service. Mourning is not happy, but it is consistent with serenity and it lays the groundwork for future happiness. So don't be afraid of being sad. That is progress compared to suffering. Now, uh, I would like to say so much more, but I'm just going to say a few words about the positive. You know, Leonard Peikoff has a subhead in OPAR titled Happiness is the Normal Condition of Man. Happiness is normal in the sense that if you consistently act in your rational self-interest, you will be happy, barring some external circumstances. The hitch is the action needs to be in your actual rational self-interest, not what you think is in your rational self-interest. And for us non-geniuses to be right about that kind of thing most of the time, it is Ayn Rand's total philosophic system that we call upon. I've, in this talk, in explaining how you can understand the values, I've called on pr principles from metaphysics, from epistemology, from ethics, And this is the basis for all of the positive work you do to gain your values. I mean, I've made that, that is like the central work that I do in the thinking lab. But what we've done today, I hope I've given you a fuller understanding of what happiness is, that it's a totality, a state of, of happiness that encompasses every aspect of your life. And I hope I've opened up some ideas for how you personally can either remove suffering or grow your happiness. You know, Howard Rourke's life is not easy. It's not without pain and grief. But the suffering only goes down so far. He is happy. And thanks to Ayn Rand, 
we can be too. Thank you. According to my timer, we have five minutes for questions. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Great. Hi. Can you hear yes. me? Yes, I can. How does um, meditation fit into this th your uh, theory yeah. of happiness? So I think that meditation is something that ha can help you get serenity. I think it's one of the things that's out there that you can learn that can help you calm down and it, you know, it reduces your scope of action. Meditation is not a positive thing, but it does help you get to a place where you're not overloaded and you, are, uh, you have some control over your mind. So I think, it, it, I think it's something that would help you get to serenity, which is a base for future happiness. Thank Good? you. Okay. First of all, I have to say I love your talk. Uh, Thank this you. This is my favorite. For day. And I wanted to ask for you, ask, uh, ask you uh, how, how can you teach one person um, what happiness is if all their life, all, all, all of his life, all they all the feel, all that person feel was pain and suffering? I mean, suppose that happiness is a concept of consciousness. Um, for isolated two units, you need, you need to, to see, see it, it in your own life. Right, yeah. I mean, you can't form a concept without some awareness of the facts, and if you've never experienced any, uh, if you've experienced only pain and suffering, how would he form the yeah. concept? So, I'm gonna challenge your assumption. It, it, it is not possible to have only pain and suffering. You'd be dead. It's simply not possible. He has to have taken some action to achieve some values to even be alive. You know, happiness is part of life. How did he get, what has he done? So I would look at this person. So maybe you have someone in mind, but uh, look at them and look at what have they actually achieved in their lives. And talk with them about what happened. There's got to have been some moment of joy. There's got to have been some moment of pride. There's got to have been some kind of confidence. And that's where you could then get those concepts. So that's what I would say, okay? Thank you so much. Okay, great. And I, if, if, there's, if people want ideas for questions, there was some extra material that I had to cut that's actually indicated on the bottom of your handout so you can ask about that. Okay, next. I'll, I'll be glad if you can talk about the difference between contentment and uh, apathy, flat affect, being stoic, indifference. Okay. Yeah, so I'm not, a, I'm not a, in favor of stoicism. That would be more in the serenity area where, you know, you're functional. When you're, when you're serene, you're functional. Um, but that is not a stable state. If you are not actually getting joy from the actions that you're taking, you are not getting the emotional fuel you need to keep living. And what happens to people if they are if they just try to get to that zero, is that it eventually degrades. So uh, let me see if I can say this in another way. Um, well, actually, how did that land? Does that address what your question is? Or? Right, I meant um, serenity. Not, uh... Right, I, I would say that it's trying to go for serenity, and that is, that's no way to live, right? So uh, this is the point I wanted to make that flitted through my mind. I actually just talked about this last week in a class. Every action you take uses energy, and your investment of energy needs to pay off in more energy, right? So if you, if you uh, take physical exercise, you need to replenish the physical fuel. If, if you run a business and you invest money, you need to actually make more money. This is also true for pleasure. Pleasure is the source of motivation for actually getting up in the morning. And it's, if, you don't have, if you don't have some sources of pleasure in your life, if you use them up in stoicism, in just, you know, no affect, slowly but surely you will burn out. So that is not a long-term strategy. Okay? Thank you. Makes sense. Okay, great. 
just want to thank you for an incredible talk that was very valuable to me. Um, just curious, how does one identify that they've reached a state of overload? Like, you know, what are these oh. warning signs in, in your experience? And, you know, what can you do to sort of, you know, uh, sort of better your thinking methods to know, okay, I've reached a state of overload? Okay, so overload is directly introspectable. It is a state. So, okay, I'm going to start talking in a very fast state. Are you having trouble keeping up with me? Because I'm having trouble keeping up with me. Did you actually get some tension and nervousness? Did you actually notice that? I'm not sure that was a good example. But uh, actually, everyone start talking to him at once. OK. <laughs> You've been overloaded, right? How did it feel? Not great. <laughs> OK, you remember that? OK, when that happens, stop. That's really, this is a great example of something that is a directly introspectable experience. It's like. How, how, uh, how do I know if I'm warm? Mm. Okay, it's exactly the same. If you're, if you're like feeling, if you're like, oh, what was that, what was that? Okay, you're overloaded, you can actually, now, if you're focused on something else, you can actually be surprised to find out that you're overloaded. That's okay, there's no guilt in not having noticed that you were overloaded. That's not out of focus. When you do notice, because you monitor and every few minutes you check in and then you realize, oh wow, I've got like a headache from what I'm trying to do here. OK, pause. When you notice it, that's when you intervene. Is that helpful? It is. Thank you. OK, great. Uh, do you think someone with chronic pain, lifelong chronic pain, can't be happy? Or do you think it changes their standard? Well, I mean, I think that the goal, if you've got chronic pain, is definitely to go to serenity. Is, that's what your first goal is. You need to accept the limitations on your life and other things. You should also, Christopher is here, you should see Christopher Blakesley, who is a role model for anyone who has chronic pain or chronic illness and is coaching people out of that. So today in the 21st century, the number of options you have so that this chronic condition can actually be radically mitigated are huge. And uh, that's what I would, that's what actually I would advise for someone with chronic suffering. I do think that it is, I mean, you, it's not the case, like you probably get, even if you have chronic pain, you can probably get to say 50% joy. And I would do that. I would do that. It may not qualify as happiness, but it's way better than 10%, right? Okay. Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay, great. Jean, I'd love to hear the part that you cut. <laughs> Do we have two minutes? Yes. Okay, all right. So actually, it's not really fair, but I, since it was on the handout, I figured I should ba basically say something. Uh, you know, at the bottom of your handout, what I tried, to, I mean, there was a lot of how do you deal with suffering in this. And I don't want to leave you with the idea that suffering, dealing with suffering is the main thing in happiness. It's not. It's not. It's just the low-hanging fruit for a 45-minute talk on happiness. Uh, so I put this teaser on the bottom of your handout with these three sources, areas you can work on for greater and greater happiness. Satisfaction with your past, a focus on your values in the present, and goals you believe you can achieve in the future. And these are all possible. So how can you be satisfied with your past? Well, if there's a past incident that is bothering you, you have some unfinished business. Maybe it's mourning. Maybe it's something else. When you go and you investigate that and are not afraid of the sadness, you figure out how to deal with it, and you create a new ending to the story. Often you turn it into a learning experience. And I mean, I think about there's a story from when I was eight, and I find, it was a terrible story. It caused me so much pain. It's actually the one thing I know I repressed in my childhood. And I understood it, and I understood it. I don't feel pain over that anymore. I learned so much from that episode. I changed the end of the story, and I am now satisfied with that whole arc. You know, they say the only difference between a tragedy and comedy is where you put the end. Okay, if it's a tragedy, you need to write some more plot. Okay. Um, 
Second one, a focus on your values in the present. This is always possible. Always possible. I sum this up as motivating every action by appeal to values, not threats. I mean, literally every single action. Now, this is, you'd be surprised. This sounds like common sense, right? This is easier said than done. Just last week, someone who understands this point told me she needed to feed her cats because otherwise they would die. That's an appeal to a threat, not a value, right? Now, as soon as she saw that, she could turn it around to, I want to feed the cats because I love them and I want them to be healthy and happy. And what happened? Her affect changed completely. But this took a volitional act. You need to notice, gee, the words I'm coming through, I'm focusing on the threats. Well, a threat is a threat to a value. What's the value that you want here? It takes an intervention, but it can always be done because a threat is a threat to a value, and it will change your affect. And the third one, goals you believe you will achieve in the future. This is always possible, but you need to be totally objective, totally objective about where you're starting from. What is your present knowledge? What is your present skill? What are your present values? And maybe, if it's going to get in the way, many old patterns of mistakes, you know, second-handedness or something like that that you've spotted, if you take those completely seriously, you can find the steps now that will lead to the greatest of achievement. But only if you start from where you are. These are, you know, this is a teaser because this is not actionable but I hope it's inspirational. I hope it's inspirational. You, you can be happy. Your happiness is your life. This is the most important thing in your life, is to learn how to create your own happiness. And I hope this lecture has helped you with that.